What's up guys, John Stargarian here. I just want to briefly break down my dog plays for UFC 250. I had originally planned to do a deep dive on each video, a video for each, but I have guests this weekend, so I just don't have time. So I'm just going to hit out a few quick ones here. I have a few plays this week. Um, three dogs on the money line, a couple props, but basically the, my general theme here is kind of fading unknowns. Uh, specifically unknowns are coming off quick finishes. And so the first play I have is Evan Dunham. I played him for one unit, plus 210 against Herbert Burns. And the thinking here is pretty straightforward. You know, Dunham has been retired for 18, 19 months, something like that. And that's a concern coming in here. He's 38 years old. And, but, you know, he's not just coming off the couch. You know, he'd been training for a fight with Michael Johnson before all the COVID stuff started happening. And so there's reason... So I don't think he's out of shape. He's not just coming in for a paycheck. He was planning to come back anyway. Uh, and then, you know, for Dunham, you know, there's real concerns about his durability. You know, he's finishing consecutive fights to the body. And that's obviously always worrisome. Um, no question, it's a worry here. But I'm not sure Burns is the guy to take advantage of it. So if you look at Herbert Burns, you know, what Burns does really well is jiu-jitsu. Like, that's really it. You know, he's got incredible jiu-jitsu, in particular off his back. Almost all of his finishes have actually come off his back. The problem for Burns is I just don't think he does anything else at really a UFC level. Um, you know, I know he got that finish, that flying knee finish against Landwehr from the clinch, but that he wasn't even looking at him when he landed it. It seemed kind of random. Uh, the tape, his striking doesn't look very good. You know, the Landwehr KO was actually his first KO, and this isn't a young guy who's developing his power. Burns is 32 years old here, so we're not talking like you know you would have thought you'd see some of this in the regional scene, especially in some of the fights where he wasn't able to land takedowns or get the fights to the mat via pulling guard, and in those fights he lost. And so I don't rate his striking very highly. And so for him to get his jiu-jitsu going, he basically needs to be able to wrestle. And I personally don't think Burns is a very good wrestler. I think his entries are very slow. And he also, you know, he's a single shot wrestler, which basically means he needs to get, he doesn't chain takedowns at all. You know, if he shoots and misses, you know, that's kind of it. You're out of danger. And, you know, that's a problem against Evan Dunham, who's actually a very good wrestler. Uh, and even in the event that Burns can get Dunham to the ground, you know, he's not even close to a lock to finish him. Dunham's a first-degree black belt under Robert Drysdale. The only time he's ever been submitted was after he got put down by Donald Cerrone and was already hurt. So I just don't think – I don't think Burns is a reliable way to win minutes because Dunham actually is decent in the stand-up. He pushes a real high pace. He's got a good striking differential, pretty good head movement. And so I look at this fight and, you know, in my head, I'm like, I just don't – like, if this fight was three years ago – Evan Dunham would be literally minus 200 in the spot. Like, no question about it. But instead, because he's off to two being finished twice and Burns is coming off two first-round finishes, Burns is minus, two, is, is minus 200 and Dunham sitting as a big dog. And to me, it doesn't make much sense. Look, it's totally possible Dunham is washed. But even in the event that he's washed, like, I think he's crafty enough that he could be competitive. And I honestly think Dunham could probably take Burns down and hold him there and avoid danger and just grind him out. But yeah, I mean, look, obviously there's a risk with Dunham's body and being soft to the body. And, you know, maybe Burns finishes in that way. That's very possible. But it's such a big dog number. I'm happy to do it. I think Dunham's currently plus 170, plus 180. And I still think that's kind of value. So yeah, I have a plan Dunham. Second play is Devin Clark. Played him for a unit plus 186. And, you know, Devin Clark, been a really inconsistent fighter throughout his career. He's generally lost when he's taken big steps up in competition. Uh, I don't think this is that, though. And so... You know, Clark, the one thing you can really, really rely on Clark for is to wrestle in volume. You know, that's what he does. He lands about three and a half takedowns per 15 minutes. You know, he shoots about seven and I think seven and a half per 15, which is a strong rate for light heavyweight. So he's got, and you know, he's actually, he's not a bad striker. That's the thing. He's got decent boxing, but, you know, he's been labeled kind of as chinny. I'm not really sure how true that is, to be honest, because he's only been, I believe he's only been KO'd twice, but once was when he cut down to middleweight, which probably sapped his durability a bit, and the other times against Alex Rakic, and you know, you really can't take too much from getting KO'd by Rakic. But at any rate, you know, the biggest issue with Clark is he can kind of be a bit of a head case in there, you know, sometimes he'll just back up to the fence and accept position and just let his guys pressure him. But when he's fighting smart and he's pursuing takedowns, I actually like his game a bit. He's got a very good round-winning style. And so I think that could suit him well here. And, you know, Alonzo Menafield, I'm not particularly high on. I mean, I could be high on him, but I don't think we have enough data to be high on him at this point. So I think Menafield's only gone into the second round like once or twice in his career and never passed at the 36-second mark in it. And so that's a concern. 
Second thing is, you know, while he has elite power, I actually don't trust his striking really much at all. Like, he's got power, but he tends to swing wild hooks. And I've seen him get dinged on the regional scene and get hurt in the pocket. And he tends to just leave his chin out there, you know, when he's swinging. And that's, you know, a concern. You know, Clark doesn't have KO in the UFC yet, but he's hurt a lot of guys. And, like, you know, he could definitely catch Menafield here. And the other part of Menafield is, you know, he seemed like a pretty good offensive grappler from his tape. But there's not a whole lot of data of his defensive grappling. And, you know, the one real data point there is his first contenders fight against Daniel Jolly. And Jolly took him down twice in the first round of that fight. And the first time, Menafield couldn't get up, was stood up by the referee. And the second time, he didn't get up. Frankly, Jolly might have won that round, but then Jolly retired on a stool after the first round. But, you know, that's concerning, especially against a guy like Clark who's going to attempt takedowns at a high rate. You know, Clark's a better wrestler than Jolly. And if, you know, Menafield was struggling to get up against Jolly, it's very possible he's going to struggle here. Now, look, that fight was a couple of years ago, so it's extremely possible Menafield's made major improvements and can either deny the takedown completely or just pop right up from it. And if that happens, then he's going to probably look like a favorite. But again, this is kind of my theme here. I don't think you can cap what you don't know. And we don't know that Menafield is, has made that improvement. And the other thing is he's shown, there's two other things that concern me with him. He's shown questionable fight IQ. You know, he basically plunged into the clinch against both Moreira and Paul Craig, which made no sense because he had a massive advantage at range. And if he does that here, I don't think he's going to win a clinch war with Clark. I think he'll likely end up on his back. Um, yeah, so I've played Clark for plus 186. The other concern I have for Menafield really is his cardio. We haven't seen him gas yet, but like I said, he's barely gotten into the second round. And a guy that's that muscle-strapped, who uses that much energy when he strikes, those guys don't generally have good gas tanks. And so I don't – I shouldn't say I'm confident he doesn't have a good gas tank, but I think there's reason to believe that could be the case. So, again, I can't cap him having a bad gas tank without seeing it, but I think it's in play. And ultimately, I just don't – you know, Menafield could come out of here and just kill Clark immediately. Wouldn't shock me. But I don't think you can justify – I don't think you can justify a line over, like, minus 122. You know, Clark is a massive step up in competition for Menafield from Craig and Marrera. And on the regional scene, Menafield was, like, minus 800, minus 1,000 in just about every fight. And so it's like, you know – it's a big prove-it fight for Menafield for me, and capping him as a big favorite just doesn't seem right. So, yeah, unit on Clark, plus 186. Um, last money line play I have on a dog here is on Eddie Wineland, and I missed the line bad on this. I picked it up plus 310 for a unit. I can currently get him about plus 380. I might even go over plus 400 by the weekend with the way favorites have getting pounds late since the COVID stuff started. But... Look, I don't hate Sean O'Malley. You know, he's exciting. Um, he's got a very dynamic striking style. He's clearly a pretty good finisher. I, all of those things are great. But as I've said, I don't think you can cap things, cap what you haven't seen. And what I have seen from O'Malley against pretty low-level competition against Terry and Ware, you know, O'Malley guessed hard in the second round of that fight. And he lost the second round on every card to Ware. Um Ware, though, gassed even harder in round three. And O'Malley was able to take over and dominate the third round. But nonetheless, that's very concerning. You know, Terry and Ware, I don't think, is very good. And he was able to just kind of come forward and exchange without any concern with O'Malley um, at will. And actually, if you look at O'Malley's contenders fight, too, uh, Caracasian actually tagged him a bunch of times early before O'Malley hurt him. And so it's like, again, I'm not saying O'Malley's striking defense is bad or that he's bad. But, you know, we've seen some holes. And, you know, O'Malley's style... It's constant movement. Uh, it's constantly throwing kicks, moving laterally. It's a very exhausting style, so it's not surprising that he showed some cardio cracks. Now, we didn't see that against Sukumatath in his next fight, but Sukumatath's pretty bad and didn't do a tremendous job at pressuring him. So, you know, it's hard to really know. And then in his last fight against Tago Quinones, you know, I've seen people say he made major improvements, and it's like, oh, really? I mean, that fight lasted 90 seconds. I don't think we can take much from it. And so with Wineland, it's like, I don't know. So with O'Malley, let me finish with O'Malley first. With O'Malley, we don't know if he's cleaned up the cardio issue. Uh, we don't know how his chin is really like because, you know, we wear it doesn't really hit hard. And Caracasian, when he was touching him, got finished before we could really kind of wear him down. So we don't really know what his durability is like. We don't really know what his cardio is like. We don't really know what his grappling is like. I don't expect grappling to play really any role here because Wineland's probably not going to try to take him down. And he probably can't take Wineland down. But... You know, the chin and cardio are concerns, and the things that we 
do know about Eddie Wyman is that he will pressure when it's advantageous to him. Uh, he has real power and he, he's pretty durable and he, yeah, you know, that's really, that, 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 I mean, that's it. But like, think if you think about that, you know, if Wineland pressures for 15 minutes and O'Malley can't put him out and look, O'Malley could put him out, but you know, Wineland's only actually been KO'd once, technically three times, but once with an injury and once with a pretty questionable stoppage. You know, if one, if O'Malley can't get him out and Wineland's pressuring, you know, there's, if O'Malley starts to gas like he did against Ware, this is not Terry and Ware throwing at him. Eddie Wineland can really, really hit hard. That's one of those things he can still do at 36 years old. And he's a pretty good boxer. You know, the question is, I guess for me, is I think early Wineland's going to have a lot of trouble getting inside O'Malley's range because O'Malley is so good at keeping distance with his kicks. And I think that's going to cause Wineland a lot of issues. But if O'Malley starts to slow and he can start finding boxing range in the last two rounds, I think it's going to get real dicey um, for O'Malley. Not that I think he'll lose, but I think it'll get competitive. And to me, that's just, you know, it's just something you have to keep in mind here because, like, I don't think you can cap O'Malley better than, say, minus 230 in the spot. And so I think there's good value on Wineland. I don't think he's the guy to get it done, but I do think there's value. So yeah, those are my three money line plays this week, guys. Uh, you can find my props on my Twitter. But yeah, hope you enjoy the video. Follow or fade. And if you follow, let's make some money. And if you fade me, good luck. Um, let's Looking forward to UFC 250.